Hey there. Welcome to a deep dive you specifically requested. We're taking your research on Scientology and um, I gotta say, you really went deep, especially on the psychology behind their practices, auditing and theta, wogs. Oh, it's fascinating stuff. And you know, the key here is we're not debating if Scientology is right or wrong. That's not our thing. Totally. It's more like, how is this stuff working on people? You right. Know? The mechanisms. Exactly. The psychology. And you dove right into the deep end with uh, with body routing and regging, those street encounters they're known for. Yeah. Basically, their outreach and fundraising tactics. But what's interesting is how they're using, like, straight up Psychology 101. Oh, totally. And you even shared this one story. Someone's walking down the street gets convinced to take this personality test. Next thing you know, bam, they're signed up for courses. It's classic social pressure, right? Like, think about those experiments where people agreed with the obviously wrong answer just because everyone else did. Oh, yeah, just to fit in. Exactly. So now picture yourself feeling maybe a bit self-conscious on a busy street, and suddenly you're surrounded by these super friendly Scientologists. It's it's kind of hard to say no. Plus, didn't you mention, too, that, like, they're known for being super nice, like, especially right off the bat? Oh, yeah. The love bombing technique, right? Yeah. Overwhelm someone with positivity, make them feel super special, create that instant bond. Which makes it that much harder to be like, wait a minute, you know, or even to walk away once you're in deeper. Exactly. And, and let's not forget the Barnum effect, how we all kind of resonate with those vague personality descriptions, <laughs> even though they could apply to like anyone. Oh, totally. Like you're a natural leader, but sometimes you doubt yourself. Who, who doesn't relate to that? Right. And... Your research highlighted how Scientology uses these, you know, personality tests and readings. Might seem insightful. Or... It's playing on our psychology, making us more receptive to what comes next. And that's where it gets even more interesting. Because now we're talking auditing and the infamous E-meter. Which, your research on this, so from what I understand, they're trying to get rid of and theta, this negative energy, right? Yeah. Through auditing. And the E-meter is like their tool to measure it. Okay, so stay with me here. You're encouraged to like reveal super personal stuff, often about past trauma while you're holding these electrodes, right? Yeah. And any fluctuations on the E-meter get interpreted as... Holding on to that in theta. So you're trying to get rid of it, but by reacting, you could be, like, holding on tighter. Exactly. It's a total no-win situation, a double bind. And that, psychologically, it's like this pressure to perform. And that pressure alone could create more N theta, even if it's just like subconscious anxiety, right? It's wild. It is. And you know what's interesting? The E meter itself might just be picking up on something totally natural. The ideomotor effect. Ever used a Ouija board? Oh, so that's what's going on there. It's not ghosts, is it? Nope. It's your subconscious, like moving your hand ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. Same thing with dousing rods and stuff. The emitter picks up on these micro movements. So it might not be in theta at all, just your hand twitching, but because yeah. of the context, it takes on a whole other meaning. Exactly. And that, my friend, is how belief can take root. Whoa. Okay. So we've got social pressure, intense vulnerability during auditing. And then you add in this idea that in theta is something you need to be free from. And suddenly you're in deep. Yeah. It all plays into this escalation of commitment. The more you invest, the harder it is to walk away, even with doubts. Especially if those doubts are just in theta fighting back, right? Yeah. Man, this is heavy stuff. But you know, your research, you didn't shy away from the heavy stuff at all. You really wanted to understand those control mechanisms like KSW, WOG, the disconnection policy you were not messing around. Yeah, like, give me all the psychology. And you know what? I think we're ready to tackle those next. Let's do it. This deep dive is just getting started. So last time, things got, like, seriously intense, auditing and theta. But then you took us even deeper with those social control mechanisms in Scientology. Like, what? Right. You were really interested in terms like KSW WOG. Yeah. The disconnection policy, like the big ones, you know, mm -hmm. when it comes to how they shape behavior within the group. It's like you looked at that psychology playbook and said, game on. Totally. And... Honestly, Scientology, it's like a case study. So uh -huh. let's start with KSW, keeping Scientology working. Sounds harmless, right? Yeah, who doesn't want things to work? Exactly. But then in practice, it's like this unquestioning belief in Hubbard's teachings as like the ultimate truth. Anything else. Dangerous. Which, you know, you brought up in your research how questioning Hubbard is a no-go. Big time taboo. And that's where those thought terminating cliches come in. You know, like... Phrases like KSW, they just shut down thinking, critical right. thinking. It's like, end of story, Hubbard said it, boom. Oh, man. It's like when you're arguing and someone hits you with that one line, you're like, well, okay, conversation over. 
That's KSW in action. Exactly. It's about keeping things like ideologically pure, even if it means like no real discussion. And that feeds right into that us versus them, which your notes on that were spot on, like with WOG, which is basically like a derogatory term for anyone outside of Scientology. Instant in group, out group. Yeah. Makes it easier to, you know, dismiss people who aren't in the system. And that's where the disconnection policy comes in, which I know you had some thoughts on that. Yeah. I mean, to think someone might be pressured to just cut off their friends, even family, because they're like, Scientology, I don't know about mm -hmm. that. It's really sad. And those knowledge reports you shared about, intense. It's like dystopian novel stuff. Imagine being told to report on your family, your friends, if they break any rules. Creates this atmosphere, right? Yeah. Surveillance. Yeah. Mistrust. Always watching what you say. Who can you even trust, you know? And that fear, that holding back, it just reinforces that need for control. If you're always worried about saying the wrong thing, you're not going to, like, challenge anything. It's a loop. And then, for those who do speak out or try to leave, they're ostracized, labeled a suppressive person. It's like their whole world is gone. So isolating. And then you add in the pressure to conform, the constant, look, success stories, no wonder it's so hard to break free. Yeah, especially when you think about how Scientology impacts how you see yourself. And that's where your research takes another interesting turn. Right, pulling it in and clearing the planet. You're all over that. Because that's where we see how Scientology shapes not just how you see the world, but yourself in it. Like, okay, we've got the control thing down, now let's talk about self-control. Exactly. And it all links back to those psychology basics we keep finding. Ready to dive into pulling it in. Hit me with it. All right, so we're back and ready to tackle this idea of pulling it in that you were so curious about. Yeah, this is where things get really interesting, psychologically speaking. Because it's about how Scientology influences not just your view of the world, but your view of yourself. Okay, so break it down for me. What exactly does pulling it in even mean in this context? So in Scientology, there's this idea that you are responsible for everything that happens to you, good or bad. Wait, so like if something bad happens, it's my fault? That's the basic idea. And if something bad does happen, you're expected to pull it in. Meaning like you got to examine your own actions, your own thoughts, and figure out what you did to cause it. Wow, that seems like a lot of pressure. It is. And you know, from a psychological perspective, this kind of thinking can be like really intense because it can lead to a lot of self-blame, even in situations where honestly you had no control. Right. Like it's not exactly empowering if you're constantly blaming yourself for everything. Right. Exactly. And in some cases, it can even prevent people from like recognizing and addressing actual external problems. Yeah. Like if you believe you pulled in a car accident, you might not see the need to advocate for safer streets. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So pulling it in, it's about taking responsibility, but maybe too much responsibility to the point where it's not really healthy. Yeah. And it can definitely be used manipulatively, like to silence dissent within the group. If someone speaks out against a Scientology policy and then something bad happens to them, well, they must have pulled it in, right? It's like a way to shut down any kind of criticism. Because yeah. if you criticize and then something bad happens, it's like you're proving them right. Exactly. And that brings us to another concept you were really interested in clearing the planet, which is a whole other level of psychological complexity. Okay, so remind me, what is clearing the planet all about? It sounds kind of nice, actually. Well, on the surface, it sounds great, <laughs> right? It's this idea that Scientology can create a world without war, without crime, without insanity. A utopia, essentially. Yeah, sign me up. Right. But here's where the psychology gets really interesting. To achieve this utopia, Scientologists believe that everyone on Earth needs to go through Scientology's auditing process and achieve a state of clear. So it's like a massive undertaking. Massive is an understatement. And that's where the whole thing bumps up against some, well, let's call them cognitive biases. Uh, okay, I'm intrigued. Tell me more. Well, first off, there's this thing called the planning fallacy. We, as humans, are notoriously bad at estimating how long things will actually take. We tend to be way too optimistic. Oh, yeah, I am terrible at that. Right. So yeah. imagine applying that to something as complex as, like, auditing every single person on the planet. Like, even if it were possible, it would take way, way longer than anyone could possibly imagine. Exactly. Yeah. And then you add in things like sleep deprivation, which is unfortunately common in some branches of Scientology, yeah. especially for those at higher levels. Like, really? Why? Well, it's seen as a way to, like, push past your limits, achieve higher spiritual awareness. But the thing is, 
sleep deprivation actually makes that planning fallacy even worse. So not only is it an unrealistic goal, but the people working towards it are literally too tired to realize it. It's kind of a perfect storm of cognitive biases. Yeah. And when you combine that with the social pressure to conform, the fear of being labeled a suppressive person if you question anything, yeah. it's a powerful recipe for, well, keeping people in the system. Man, you know, when you lay it all out like that, it's kind of hard to see it any other way. And honestly, it makes you think about other areas of life where these tactics are used. Like you said earlier, advertising, politics, even just like our everyday relationship. Oh, absolutely. It's everywhere. Yeah. And that's why this deep dive has been so fascinating, because it's not just about Scientology. It's about understanding these psychological mechanisms that influence us all. Exactly. It's about being more aware, asking questions, and really thinking critically about the information we're being fed, which is exactly what you did by sending in your research and requesting this deep dive. So from both of us, a huge thank you to you for sparking such a thought-provoking conversation. Yes. And for everyone listening, remember, knowledge is power. The more we understand these mechanisms, the better equipped we are to make choices that align with our own values and well-being. Beautifully said. And on that note, we'll be back next time with another listener-requested deep dive that's sure to get those brain gears turning. Until then, stay curious, everyone.